Welcome back, everyone. We're now on lecture 14. This is usually referred to as the period of antiquity, the late era. We're looking, though, at specifically at the rise of Christianity in the Western Roman Empire, and we'll be looking at that up until about the time of Constantine in this section, lecture 14. So again, remember that we're looking at the Roman Empire following the era of the Tetrarchs, and then the reconsolidation of power under a single emperor under the ruler Constantine. So Constantine is uh, the person who's credited with being the first uh, Christian Roman emperor. He makes Christianity legal to practice in the empire. But prior to his uh, edicts that allow for the practice of Christianity openly, which leads, of course, to Christianity becoming the dominant religion in the empire, prior to that period, Christianity had been uh, one of many mystery cults practiced throughout uh, the Roman Empire. The general rule was not to overtly oppress the Christians, particularly if people uh, had been Christian and converted to one of the pagan religions that the Romans preferred. Uh, they tended to forget about the fact that they had been uh, Christian in their past. Uh, it is really under the emperor you know, that the beginning of persecution of Christians begins in earnest. Nero blamed the Christians for the uh, burning of Rome. Of course, famously, Nero, quote unquote, fiddled while Rome burned. He blamed the Christians for it. Uh, we also see, though, after the fall of Nero, the Flavian dynasty really solidifies its power um, and its right to rule by the sack of Jerusalem. And it's at that point, strangely enough, the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem that really begins um, to create what we consider the modern era or the beginnings, rather, of um, how we see Judaism and Christianity being practiced today. Um, in fact, Christianity, in some respects, didn't separate itself that much from traditional Judaism until the moment of really the sack of the temple. Uh, Judaism becomes then less centered uh, in traditional uh, ancestral power of uh, priesthood. It falls more into a more democratic uh, religion based on study through the power of rabbis and the establishment of synagogues rather than a single central temple. And we see Christianity begin to be preached by Christ's first uh, disciples, the evangelists, and they uh, solidify some power of the Christians in the city of Rome. Um, but in particular, Peter begins to preach um, outside of Rome as well. And so we start to have, um, or Paul rather, begins to preach outside of Rome. So we have the movement of the spread of this religion, um, partially due to the fact that the Jews were used kind of as a scapegoat to establish and solidify the power of the Flavian dynasty. So the Christians were able to practice, but they practiced their religion in a slightly different way than one might expect. And we can see that happening here in the city of Dura Europas. Now, Dura Europas was an outpost of the Roman Empire. It is located along the Euphrates River in what is today Syria. And we have evidence of this city acting as a, a crossroads of multiple cultures. So Dura Europa was, was also a place that had been under the control of the Greeks, um, under the, the power of Alexander. We also see it becoming eventually an outpost of Rome. So multiple cultures uh, collide here, multiple languages, multiple religious traditions. And we see that very much in the interior decoration for the synagogue that survives in Dura Europa. And you see here that the paintings are similar in some ways to the style that we're going to see throughout the empire in Christian art and into later Byzantine art. The proportions are a little bit less 
realistic, naturalistic, believable, um, the way that we saw uh, the sculptures and the verism of the Republic and the early empire, we're now seeing more of a return to symbolic uh, use of visual images. People are represented at a larger scale if they are of greater importance. The figures tend to present themselves in a very frontal manner. The bodies and the anatomy underneath the robes is less important uh, than the overall narrative storytelling within these types of images. One of the more interesting things about the uh, frescoes here in the synagogue is that the images tell a variety of stories, Old Testament stories, but we also see that God does appear in a few of the images. Uh, God appears only in the form of hands. In particular, he emerges from the top border of images, as in this scene, as Moses is about to part the Red Sea, you see the hand of God at the top assisting in this miracle, bringing that miracle about. It's kind of a remarkable image. We know that in Dori Ropas, the Christians also practiced their religion not in a synagogue, but more in um, private homes. And those homes were orchestrated around a central courtyard. You see that courtyard here in the center. The entrance to the home would be here. There's also, though, in this Christian uh, home church. We have a baptistry and font here. You've got a space for a Sunday school here. And this large space to the side is the actual church itself. So again, in this diagram, it's a little easier to see. Courtyard, baptistry, church. So this is a baptistry from Dura Europa, so you can see it is painted as well. And you can see the figures, although a lot of it is destroyed, you can see that the figures on their way to be baptized are dressed all in white. So clearly the symbols that we associate with these religions are being used fairly uh, consistently um, from the era of the Western Empire. You see the menorah there. This is a catacomb. This is a family burial area. We sometimes uh, have it in our minds that the Christians hid in the catacombs, but in fact, the catacombs were used for the burial of the dead. This is a Roman catacomb that shows kind of a blending of Christian imagery as well as imagery that relates to the Jewish faith. And so you can see that people are um, still beginning to differentiate slightly between these two approaches to the faith. The catacombs, generally speaking, um, serve only as burial sites, but they do serve as places where Christians would be able to indulge in creating artwork that would depict important symbolic images for them. Among those symbolic images, one of the things that's kind of unique um, and unusual for us in the 21st century is we don't see an enormous number of crosses or images of Christ being crucified. Instead, we see images that relate that concept of the sacrifice of Christ and the resurrection through what we call prefiguration, images that are symbolically representing from the past that event yet to come in the future. So one of the most popular images that would be used to denote the idea of uh, the Christian crucifixion, death, resurrection of Christ is in fact the figure of Jonah. And you see Jonah depicted in multiple ways, both in carvings, in frescoes, mosaics, etc., in early Christian art, because of course, just as Christ's body was in the tomb for three days and then resurrected, we have Jonah spending three night, three days and three nights in the belly of the whale before he emerges unharmed. And so this is a almost a secret coded way of showing a figure that feels like it comes from a pagan myth, but in fact is representative of the idea of Christ's resurrection. This is a digital reconstruction. This is the first actual attempt to create using digital technology, the layout of the uh, 3D model of a 
Roman catacombs. So you can see that these are subterranean, um, which does make sense within a city as den densely packed as Rome itself, that burials would either have to have taken place outside of the city or underground. And that certainly makes sense here for the catacombs. The Good Shepherd Catacomb is one to know for the test. It consists of frescoes that include, as we mentioned earlier, the image of Jonah, but also in the center we have a rather unique image of Christ. We see Christ presented in early Christian work in the Western Roman Empire as a figure who is a bird. Very rarely do you see him in any way associated with the crucifixion. You also see the figures surrounding our orants. They are the prayer, the figures in prayer, most likely members of a family group. So they are also showing their veneration for these figures. But you see that it allows for a slightly ambiguous read of the images. It allows it to connect visually to some of the traditions that we've seen from some of the other mystery cults in ancient Rome. So the more uh, that we look at the way that Christ is presented, we do occasionally see him as this youthful shepherd, but you will also occasionally see him in this form here, bearded and older, with the alpha and the omega symbols indicating that he is the beginning and the end of all things. This is a sculptural representation of Christ as good shepherd, which I think is very em emblematic of a connection to the figures uh, and artistic carving styles of the Greeks and the Romans. Again, it's a somewhat coded message for Christians themselves, but it does include the idea of Christ as the leader of a group, the shepherd leading the flock, but also of the, of the uh, sheep as a sacrificial animal, that symbol of Christ becoming the animal being sacrificed or being used in place of that sacrifice is also uh, very closely tied to the idea of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The traditional form of Judaism involved daily sacrifices of animals and following the destruction of the temple, that sacrifice was replaced with daily prayer. And so you can kind of see Christ acting as this bridge, as this transition begins to happen within the faith. You also see depictions of Christ beardless and younger in a pose that is somewhat similar to what we've seen in depictions of Roman senators. You see him here as an orator or as a teacher. You see him giving the word or preaching the word, which is kind of a unique form of a depiction of a god. We don't see him with other trappings or other um, signifiers of who he is through symbols. Definitely you start to see um, the Christian imagery of in, in the tradition of Roman sarcophagi. We've seen these uh, carved sculptural forms for funeral purposes before, but here we see figures that include the figure of Jonah and the whale at the left. You see Christ as the Good Shepherd again. An interesting aspect of this piece, in fact, is the fact that the heads are unfinished on the Orient figures. They would have been carved to more closely resemble the uh, members of the family who are uh, purchasing this piece for the uh, burial of one of their own. And so you can see that as we move further into uh, Christianity becoming more and more acceptable, we're now about the year 350. So it is now not only legal, but is rapidly becoming the dominant religion in the empire. We can see that the storytelling aspect really is taking precedent over the believability of the anatomy as we saw in classical sculpture. So there are still figures that show some contraposto, certainly, but the proportions are certainly different. The heads are really quite enormous for these truncated bodies. The imagery and the readability of the story becomes much more um, the central issue. When you look at this panel, anyone who knows the story of Adam, Eve, and the serpent in the garden is going to recognize those elements instantaneously. So I don't think that this should be read as the artwork becoming less successful. It is being used in a completely different fashion. The idea here is that we're starting to see uh, stories being told through visual images that are very easily readable.